Hello, I'm Suzanne Hanser, president of the International Association for Music and Medicine. I am is delighted to bring you today a recording of the special event on the 23rd of February, uh, 2023, uh, from the Comtway Medical Library at Harvard Medical School. I am indebted to my dear colleague, Dr. Lisa Wong, for hosting us and for organizing this event uh, on behalf of the Harvard Medical School Initiative on Humanity and the Arts in Medicine. And so it is with great pleasure that I wish to introduce three generations of notable uh, researchers in Stockholm, Sweden, Dr. Torres Torell, uh, Dr. Eva Botner Horwitz and Kaya Kronerstek from the Karolinska Institute, the Royal Society of Music, uh, each having taught the other. Um, and we'll start with Dr. Turell as we investigate decades of research in cultural medicine, in uh, public policy, in research related to music and medicine, specifically music interventions in a variety of settings, and um, remarkable work with large data sets as well as small. Um, we really wish to discuss unexpected findings and how this research can be translated into public policy advocacy and new attention to the immense benefit of music on health. We'll start with the eminent Dr. Torres Terrell. Thank you, Thank you for your introduction. It's a great honor for us to be here today. Uh, you are, of course, a role model for everybody when it comes to uh, the practice and the uh, exploration of um, how to use uh, music in uh, work with uh, health and uh, illness. And uh, I have a background in uh, cardiology and internal medicine but also in amateur musicianship. Uh, that combination has brought me uh, into this field. And uh, I would also add that uh, most of my research has been on stress medicine. So I have a broader psychosomatic perspective also. Uh, today, I will uh, take out some examples from uh, our own research and uh, discuss unexpected findings. And uh, I will try to, to point out uh, why we should uh, take care of our unexpected findings. Very often, the unexpected findings uh, become neglected and uh, almost thrown away. But if you do your research properly and you're satisfied with your uh, data collection and your way of analyzing your findings, then you should believe what you have seen. So uh, there will be four examples and they all represent uh, in some way or the other uh, a biological dimension in, in relation to music. So let's start with the first slide. Uh, yes. Um, yes. Now, um, as you see in this slide, I, I make propaganda for uh, the unexpected findings, uh, and they may point at important mechanisms. But the first example I'm going to show you is from uh, research on the role of genes in uh, emotional uh, handling. 
We have been used uh, the scale for alexithymia, which is the opposite of uh, uh, good ability to handle emotions. There are three dimensions in this alexithymia concept. One is the ability to uh, differentiate feelings. The second is to put words on feelings. And the third one is to communicate or not communicate feelings. Uh, high scores means poor ability and uh, low scores means good ability to deal with emotions. And this first slide shows the results from uh, the Swedish Twin Registry. This was published some years ago. And as you can see, uh, there are pretty clear findings in this case. It's based upon uh, men and women. And there are uh, more than 3,000 participants in this uh, study. Uh, as you can see, uh, if you go from the upper left corner of this diagram and you go down, uh, to the lower, uh, you go from the upper left corner to the lower right corner. Then you can see how the uh, scores indicating poor ability to handle emotions uh, decreases. And this is a highly significant finding. Uh, the striped uh, line uh, above the whole line uh, indicates uh, the effects of uh, ensemble playing. And uh, the, uh, in general, when you go from left to right here, uh, you go from no music practice. These are people who have no uh, experience of practicing music at all. And then when you go to right, you have, have people who are uh, have been practicing a lot either as singers or as instrument players. Uh, and as you can see, there is uh, the effect that the more you practice, uh, the better you seem to be on handling emotions. And the stripe line indicates that there is an additional effect of doing the music together with other people. Uh, this is uh, the diagram for men, and then you have uh, a very similar curve for women, although you also see in general that women are better uh, in their ability to handle emotions than men, at least that's what they report. Um, the, these findings uh, then are quite interesting, because although the correlations here based upon the twin registry in a way which uh, is similar to how you uh, do population studies, because we take away randomly one of the twins in each pair so that it then gets the same kind of variation that you have in the normal population. Um, our next question was then, uh, if we have this relationship between music practice uh, and uh, emotional handling uh, based upon what they've practiced all of their life, this is accumulated measure uh, and we adjust for age. Uh, how much of that is explained by genes? We have that possibility because uh, these are twins. So now we also look at the next step in this analysis, which is what happens if you uh, look at the similarity in the twin pairs. So you can look at the monozygotic twins, which have 100% uh, 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 genetic uh, makeup. Uh, their genes are absolutely identical within the pair. And then you have the uh, fraternal twins where they are like siblings. So 50% of the genes are the same within a pair. And by looking at those two and comparing them, uh, the similarity in the monozygotic twins and the similarity in the dizygotic twins, then you get a measure of, of how much 
uh, role the genes play. And as you can see in this diagram, there is no direct uh, relationship between music hours on, on the left hand side and the emotional ability here as the Toronto Alexithymia scale. And this means that when you put all of those things together in one model, uh, it turns out that the genes, uh, you have the uh, bubbles A1 and A2, these are additive effects of genes. And you can see that there are arrows that are significant pointing at music hours and uh, Toronto L exithymia scale. Th this means that uh, uh, genes contribute both to uh, your willingness to, to practice music and to spend a lot of hours doing this, and uh, also on your emotional ability. C1, that's the uh, uh, contribution that the uh, common uh, environment, which is before you uh, become adult and you spend, uh, uh, of course, your life together with the other sibling in the pair. Uh, and then in the lower diagram, you see E1 and E2. These are contributions from the environment when you have grown up. And uh, uh, there you can see that, yes, uh, both uh, the environmental factors and the genes contribute to those two variables, but uh, it is there is no direct relationship between music errors and TAS. Uh, I was very disappointed when I saw this. I had hoped, of course, that you would see more of environmental contribution in the uh, relationship between music hours and and uh, emotional ability. However, uh, in the same twin studies, they were also making uh, magnetic resonance image pictures of the brains uh, of monozygotic pairs. And then they saw uh, the dramatic thing that uh, uh, when you looked at uh, brains of uh, Paris, in, in which one of the twins had been playing the piano a lot uh, uh, in life, and the other one had not played at all. Uh, their brains were not the same. Uh, uh, the uh, playing twin had uh, larger uh, areas uh, con con uh, corresponding to uh, motoric ability in the fingers, uh, but also in the structures which which connect uh, hearing and uh, uh, music uh, perception uh, to uh, emotional structures. And uh, this includes, for instance, uh, uh, the corpus callosum, which connects the right uh, hemisphere with the left hemisphere. So this means that uh, uh, these structure which uh, deal with uh, uh, what you hear in relation to how you react uh, and also how you connect the, the two hemispheres to one another. They were uh, influenced by all this practicing because uh, there was this difference between the two twins. The corpus callosum is an interesting structure because we know that it's uh, important for emotion handling. So when we add all these things together, we, we can say that, yes, genes contribute a lot to uh, emotional ability, uh, but uh, there is still room for variation. And uh, Frederick Ullian and his uh, uh, coll uh, colleague Urian, uh, they have uh, uh, written extensively about these things, uh, and they say that uh, the main thing here is probably uh, collaboration, 
between genes and environment. And that is particularly true when you think of uh, elite musicianship, uh, really high level musicianship. So, uh, De Manzano, Orian, and uh, uh, Ulen Fredrik uh, have described this extensively in their publications. Uh, the next uh, example I would like to share with you has to do with uh, demented patients. Uh, they have a mild dementia, they live uh, in their homes and they are taken care of by a close relative. Uh, this dyad uh, of patient and relative, uh, they live uh, their slightly complicated life together and uh, it has been uh, uh, known for a long time that the uh, relatives have uh, a rather stressful life with the uh, demented person. So uh, we then decided, uh, and this is work which has been done with uh, uh, Atsita Emami as a principal investigator and Gabriela Engström as a very important researcher. And we, we uh, decided to uh, study these dyads, the, the uh, patient and the relative together. Uh, and we decided to use music intervention using an app which has been uh, constructed at the Royal College of Music and was used in this case. So uh, the uh, relative and the patient, they learn how to use this. They can select music pieces from this app and they uh, are instructed to listen together, the two of them, uh, in a daily schedule and do this every day for two months. So we are dealing with self-selected music, which they listen to together. And uh, we were interested in the following question. If we take saliva tests every day, during these two months, uh, in the early morning when they wake up, and also in the evening, uh, can we see uh, whether there is any difference in stress hormone levels uh, developing during uh, this period of music intervention? So you see the red line, which is the control group here, and you can see the uh, intervention group which is blue here and as you can see there are relatively few individuals but on the other hand you should remember that uh, we are taking uh, samples from them every day during uh, these two months uh, and uh, this means that we have a very large number of tests underlying these uh, numbers. In fact, in the order of 600 in uh, the uh, intervention group and about 300 in the other group. So, uh, and what we see is that there is a significant difference that you can see in this slide. There is a lower uh, cortisol level in the music intervention group and it's, uh, these are logarithmically transformed values. So if you uh, transform back to what we call uh, geometric means, then we see that in the blue group, it's uh, 2.0 and in the red group is 3.5 uh, nanograms per milliliter, which is a substantial difference and it is significant. However, and this is the unexpected thing, this is only in the uh, relatives. We see no uh, similar uh, significant difference in the patients. So we, of course, were disappointed. But then we started thinking, oh, this is, of course, valuable because uh, the... Uh, 
relatives have a very hard life and they really need support and all sorts of things which can help them in their difficult situation. So it, it, uh, we were comforted by thinking in this way. The next slide that I'm going to show you is from uh, an experiment which we, we did with um, young adults. They were instructed to select uh, a piece of music which they liked very much and which was um, sedative for them. They, uh, they would think that if I listened to this music, I, became, I, I become calm. And they should also select uh, another piece which would instead stimulate them. So it would be one downbeat, one upbeat uh, piece of music. These pieces uh, were played to these uh, participants uh, in random order. And uh, there were also other things happening uh, in the studio when they listened. So they couldn't predict what was going to happen. And they were also sitting uh, without moving uh, while listening. And as you can see here uh, on this slide, which shows uh, the average heart rate during the baseline situation, which is uh, to the right, and during the sedative music listening, which is to the left, and then in the middle, you can see the stimulative music. You can see that, yes, the stimulative music is associated with uh, uh, a substantial rise in heart rate, but you can also see that the sedative music seems to raise heart rate a little bit, and that difference is also significant, although the difference is much smaller. But when you come to the next slide, you can see that uh, uh, they also started to breathe faster when they listen to the stimulative music. So you have a situation in which uh, breathing rate is stimulated by the sedative music, but not by the uh, sedative music. And then when we go to the surprise here, uh, which is carbon dioxide uh, saturation, then you can see that, uh, uh, oh yes, uh, there is uh, quite a difference between the uh, stimulative music and the other conditions, which means you, you breathe so much that you get a lot of carbon dioxide out of your blood. And this is an interesting observation, I think, because we should start thinking, why does nature do this? Uh, we can think of situations where we use uh, stimulative music, such as military marches. And uh, when you play that, people become... Uh, perhaps nervous, but they also become very prepared to fight. And uh, that is maybe what this is all about. They, uh, they get prepared, they are ready to fight, and this means that they can also produce more carbon dioxide. Uh, so we should uh, accept our findings and think what that means uh, that we've been finding. This is the last uh, example that I want to share with you, which is uh, from uh, continuous heart rate and ECG recording uh, during quartet playing. They are playing a string quartet by Haydn. And uh, these are young chamber musicians uh, which go through uh, an extra and uh, I mean the, these are top students uh, and they they uh, are supposed to play to audiences that are unaccustomed to classical music which is exactly what happens in this case there are two concerts 
uh, they perform exactly the same piece. And on both occasions, they have the same kind of audience, although these are two different audiences. And th these are uh, school children. So in the first uh, concert, they, the musicians are a bit afraid and they are not accustomed to this. So they think maybe these uh, children will dislike our playing. And that affects uh, that you see uh, that there is relatively little variation in, in uh, this aspect of heart rate variability, which is called high frequency power. And that uh, corresponds uh, very much to the parasympathetic activity, which is, uh, which is counterbalancing the uh, stress, uh, which is, uh, uh, of course, what we have a little bit when we play. Uh, but the next concert, which has the number two here, in that you can see that, especially during the second movement, there is a peak in parasympathetic activity as it's mirrored by the high frequency power. And you can see that this happens in two musicians here, it's the second violin player and it's the cellist. Uh, whereas uh, in the two other musicians, uh, you see no such variation. And this ex is probably explained by the fact that the first violinist, and to some extent, the viola playing, they are both having difficult passages, uh, fast and pretty difficult to play, whereas the two other instruments are mainly supporting. And that's exactly what they described afterwards. We, we found that we should support, uh, the, particularly the first violin, which, uh, who has such a difficult uh, uh, part to play. So this was also unexpected. It was during those conditions that we could see how the parasympathetic activity could be stimulated during a supportive part of this uh, ensemble play. Now, when we uh, uh, try to digest all these examples, we should go to the general population and, and uh, give some thought to how our findings in music health research is received uh, potentially by uh, people in general. And these are data from uh, the Göteborg Institute where they every year do uh, studies of uh, what people think about various governmental activities. So they, they collect data every year on the trust in research among people in general. And uh, you can see the upper uh, staples here. They show trust in medical research. And you can see that 80% uh, in the population or so uh, believe in medical research. But the gray staples, they show how much trust there is in societal research. These are things like economy, psychology, uh, and there is a very similar curve for humanistic research. And when we think of psychosomatic medicine and research in, in uh, uh, music in relation, in relation to health, then we are probably somewhere between. Let's say that we end up at 60% people who believe what we are saying as researchers. That may sound impressive, but you could turn around and you could say that, well, it also means that if I say something to a newspaper about findings in our uh, research on health and music, or music and health rather, they, it's likely that only, that there are 40% among those reading this article who won't believe us. So we, need to uh, improve our standing in people's minds, I think. First of all, 
when you think of that, it's quite clear that we have a very uh, high production of uh, research articles nowadays. Uh, there is an estimation saying that about there are about 30,000 uh, research journals in general uh, in the world, and they produce approximately 2 million articles every year. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Um, and if you put a longer perspective and, and start already in the 17th century, you can see how much this has increased. This was uh, up to the 70s from the uh, 19, uh, uh, the 17th century. And it's a very a massive increase, of course. You can see uh, that in our institute, the Karolinska in Stockholm, uh, when I made my thesis uh, in 1971, there were about 100 new dissertations per year, and today it's more than 300. So, and what happens then when we have such high volume? Again, the thing, one of the things that happens is that politicians and uh, uh, people who uh, interpret what's going on in research, they uh, can select reports from this enormous menu and they then use their own bias. They can uh, simply select uh, the things that uh, conform with their own thinking. It just confirms what they are, what they believe themselves. That's a dangerous development, of course, because it should be the other way around. They should uh, also uh, take things that uh, uh, they may not easily like. For instance, in music and health research, we have a lot of research which have uh, a long perspective uh, and these are things which may not always be of interest to politicians because they they have a narrow time perspective. So therefore they don't select uh, those kinds of things. We also have internal problems in research, for instance, that there is uh, increasing researcher competition, and this could be a threat to quality. And we have one example in, in our country with the a surgeon, Macchiarini, who uh, managed to uh, gain support from society for very dangerous operations. And the scientific basis of that was very poor. Uh, and of course, related to that is profit striving among all these journals that may offset quality rules. They uh, like to publish at any cost, so to speak. So then the uh, scientific, uh, uh, you know, testing and uh, critique uh, doesn't have the weight that it should have. So uh, some low quality research results get through. And there is also something called publication bias, which is that, yes, in all of this publishing, there is also a tendency to publish uh, what is expected. So unexpected findings, and we are getting back now to my introduction, perhaps the unexpected findings uh, are less likely to be published. Uh, so uh, they tend to conform mainstream uh, expectations. And uh, I have an example from my own research indicating this. We, we did a study some years ago, which is a random, uh, we used the random allocation to two groups. One, uh, which is the upper part of the diagram of people who had never been singing in a choir before, but now they started to do this once 
uh, once uh, every week for one year and uh, the other one uh, were people who also wanted to start singing a choir but they had to wait so they had discussions and uh, small lectures and uh, in both groups they met once a week for a whole year and we followed various parameters i won't tell you all all about that but in this diagram you can see measures of uh, uh, testosterone which is a hormone which uh, helps the body regenerate and uh, uh, replace uh, cells that are worn out and that's therefore very important both in men and women and uh, this is just one of the hormones uh, doing these sorts of things uh, they are protective and regenerative but you can see in this case that after half a year uh, the 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 point to the left is uh, at start and then the next point is after six months and it's nine months and the the point to the right is uh, a whole year and you can see that uh, the points uh, go up very much in the choir group but not in the talk group uh, it's quite clear that uh, if we had stopped the study uh, which shows this favorable development for the choir group at that stage after half a year that we would have been uh, publishing this uh, very easily but now when the differences disappeared it was much more difficult to get published uh, it is published but uh, as a short uh, report as a short communication um, you may think that these uh, are small numbers of people, but each point is based upon six measurements going from early morning to bedtime. So although the individual uh, individuals are few, the measurements are quite substantial in number. Uh, so uh, these uh, are some of the problems we encounter in this kind of research and in general in applied research uh, but we also have one particular problem in our field which is that there is some infighting uh, people who produce uh, music and uh, arts in general are a bit afraid uh, that uh, when we find that people's health is not improving as a consequence of participating in those cultural events uh, that could be a threat they think one has to produce arts for its own sake and i agree a hundred percent with that uh, statement but we need research to understand why things work and why they don't work and we also need to know if there is something that really hurts in the last example that I talked about it would be interesting to know why the beneficial effect of the choir singing during the first half year didn't uh, stay that way during the whole year so there is something we could have learned from that uh, we are discussing those sorts of things and I'm trying to to write a book about this and uh, it's based partly on a Swedish book which uh, has been published uh, and these are some of the references to things I've been talking about uh, thank you for your attention thank you so much um Thank you for a wonderful talk. You are getting um, praiseworthy comments in the chat and a few other questions have come up, but we'll address those in the Q&A um, with the general session to make sure we have time for all of our speakers. So next up, I'm very excited to welcome Kaya Korosek. Kaya is a psychologist and violinist. 
interested in the well-being of musicians and the ways in which music can support the well-being of various societies. Kai is currently a PhD student um, focused in music and health at the Karolinska Institute and Royal College of Music in Stockholm. Her research is focused on the roles and meanings of music for autistic adults, so especially excited to learn about her work in this area today. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having us here. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Suzanne. It's such a privilege to be here. I hope that you can hear me okay. Um, I'll just find the start of my presentation. Uh, thank you, Thoris, for your presentation. I feel like there are so many themes that uh, resonate with me. I'll try to connect to them in my, in my talk. Um, you mentioned the importance of unex unexpected findings. I'll try to come back to that. Now, we had the opportunity to meet a little bit with the audience. Some of you are researchers in the field of music therapy, and you're focused on neurodiversity as well. Some of you are students. So I'll try to start at the beginning because I know that the audience is very diverse, and we're just going to kind of start out so that we're all on the same page. Uh, I will first talk a little bit about um, autism and music research in a wider context. And then in the end, I'll just have a short presentation of my PhD project because it's still in the making. Um, so autism, the, 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 the definition of it that you are most likely familiar with um, is uh, it, it considers autism as a disorder or a condition in Swedish language, and it focuses on the deficits uh, in social interaction and communication, as well as in restricted repetitive behaviors and interests. And this is sort of view that we have from the outside, how, how we can observe autism from the outside from a non-autistic perspective. But it's also very, very important to keep in mind the inside perspective, the experiential part of it. And I took an example uh, from Nick Walker's definition, and she defines uh, autism as a genetically based human neurological variant uh, that is based on different synaptic connectivity and responsiveness. Um, and this difference then results in less predictable and more intense experiences. So it's very important to keep this first person um, sort of a, a view in mind when we, when we try to research autism. Uh, and when it, when it come to, comes to autism and music, I wanted to ask you actually the audience, I'll, I'll try to repeat that for our online audience, but what, it is, what is it that you've heard so far in relation between music and autism? I'm very curious. It doesn't have to be correct. It's just what you've heard maybe on television or by reading some articles. Yes, please. Many people tell me that they, they know autistic savants Autistic are, savants. Who are immensely musically talented. True. That's a huge part of the research that is available to us. So, so skills, musical skills in relation to autism. Any, any other observations? <laughs> yes, please. Perfect pitch, exactly. Yeah, that's a huge part of the research. Perfect pitch. Yeah, so I think, I think you're onto something. Would anyone else like to add something? No, it, it, it's true. There's loads and loads of uh, research on superior music skills, often talking about uh, savants, which this is just a very, very small portion of, of autistic people, or they don't even have to be autistic. Uh, and then there's um, a lot of research in how they perceive uh, music emotionally, how they, how they process it emotionally, and then comparing these results to non-autistic people. And then lastly, there's the huge part of research is focused on music interventions to improve social and communication skills. But I think it's very important to take a look whether these, whether, whether these areas really correspond to what the autistic community um, wants, what they wish for and what they need. Uh, and here is just a quick selection of what they, uh, from, from a few articles that uh, use interviews and large um, surveys. Um, and the autistic community expressed that they want more research in mental health support, both access and the quality of mental health, um, mental health support that they can get. 
then quality of life and well-being, learning skills and training. I think that's a particularly one that I think is very apparent in music and art. I really wish there would be more research into like the pedagogical aspect of, of uh, learning music and in connection to neurodiversity. And then there's interventions that would be targeting systems and environments instead of uh, individuals. Uh, and I think we, we have great, great uh, examples of that already, but they haven't trickled down where we there's not enough yet to make them into systematic reviews. We, we had a lovely talk with Suzanne during uh, lunchtime and yeah, there's still so many opportunities to, to develop upon. Then there's the wish for uh, more of a lifetime perspective. Most of the research so far is focused on children. And lastly, uh, there's the need for more research on harms and adverse events in research and interventions. And that's a particularly important one for music and autism research, because as you'll see, it, it's very rarely addressed. Uh, and music is something that people generally feel like, oh, but it's so nice that you can't hurt anyone with music, which might not be true. Um, okay, so I wanted to quickly present an illustration of that um, through Gerrit Seger's uh, systematic review. I feel like that's the, the go-to systematic review when it comes to music therapy and autism. They've been updating this review since 2006. Uh, it is based on 26 trials, uh, but unfortunately, it's only based on children and young adults. So we don't really have that much information on adults. And what they found was large effects of music therapy on social interaction during intervention, on nonverbal communication during intervention, as well as on total autism symptom severity, both immediately after and then five to uh, one to five months post intervention. And at this point, I think a lot of you maybe already get very concerned when you hear that. Uh, maybe on, on first glance, it almost feels like very positive, very hopeful, but we really have to think about what it is that we are actually measuring because these social interaction, nonverbal communication, all of these things are based on, often based on observation. So for example, looking at how much eye contact they make during therapy or how often they initiate um, interaction. And then when it comes to autism symptom severity, it even used uh, uh, the diagnostic tools such as ADOS, uh, looking at differences in that. And then we really have to ask ourselves, is it that we are maybe only teaching them how to behave in more non-autistic ways? Um, are we just teaching them how to mask their, their autism, how, how they usually interact with the, with the world. Um, so Gerrit Zeger and colleagues, they actually mentioned masking uh, once in their report, and they, read, they, they write that such approaches might support or even provoke the masking of autistic traits, which has been reported to be associated with negative consequences for mental health, including an increase in the risk of lifetime suicidality, which is heartbreaking. And it's mentioned once in, in a 111 page long report. And I feel like I, as a, as a parent, would be very concerned at this point, um, what it is that I, we're actually doing with this. I think we really need much, much more research into what it is that we're trying to do. Um, and I, at this at this point in my presentation, I would really like to emphasize that this is not a critique of music therapy or a critique of music therapists. It's simply a concern regarding research approaches and how we measure things, how we interpret things. Torres, as you as you talked about, different ways to to see results, also unexpected results. But sometimes the expected results might indicate some unexpected phenomena or processes at, at behind that we haven't thought about. Um, and when it comes to adverse events that we talked about before, uh, they only mentioned that there's no differences between music therapy and standard care, uh, which was actually just, they only looked at how often they were hospitalized, which is already a very bad adverse event, like a very large one. So we don't know anything about Smaller, smaller, less observable um, 
events, adverse events. Um, and here is just, oh, <laughs> this moved a little bit. <laughs> no problem. Uh, so here is just an illustration of uh, what the articles, the studies that were in included in this um, overview, what they focused on um, in regards to what we talked about, what the wishes and needs of the autistic community are. So most of them, third, 23 out of 26, focused on symptoms of autism, um, their social interaction, their communication, uh, and only three of them focused on quality of life, which was actually a wish that was, that was expressed by the community. And just one of them checked for adverse events, which I think, yeah, it, it's quite sad, but at the same time, I know that many of you know that this is not, it doesn't reflect what music therapy is and what it can offer. And at this point, I think it's really us researchers that have to do a better job of representing music therapy and finding better evidence to support it, because this is at the end what, what politicians, what policymakers want to hear about, the numbers, the evidence. And at this point, maybe it is that we are picking something that's more easy to measure because we have readily available diagnostic tools. You can just go through that. Uh, it, it seems very obviously useful for this population that you would focus on, on these things that are most often discussed, like so, social interactions, communication. Then there could be that maybe there is great research, great research ideas and plans, but they don't get funding because, uh, of course, we know that, that there's always problem, problems with that. Maybe it's just that the studies that focus on, on symptom severity get more funding. And we had a very interesting uh, discussion with Torres about that. Um, uh, that it could be, Torres, I know you, you used the word uh, taming of society. Um, which I think it's very interesting to and important to keep in mind uh, what it is that we're actually doing. Uh, then there's the context that we are active in, how much, um, how much knowledge there is on neurodiversity. Is it a more pathological perspective that's present or a more neurodiversity one? Um, I think it's always, it's, it's very, very different in different contexts. And then of course that, maybe we aren't including stake stakeholders as much as we could, and they could really, there's such an untapped uh, resource of, of knowledge and expertise that um, someone who doesn't have autism simply doesn't have that knowledge. Um, so these are sort of the challenges I think we're facing, but I'm also very hopeful about the developments as well. It was so great to, to talk to Suzanne. She, uh, told me about all the wonderful things that are developing. It really seems like we are in, in a time where there's a, a large change. And unfortunately, it's just not yet reflected maybe in the evidence that we have because uh, these things take time and these should be very long trials. And I really, I'm very hopeful that we'll see this change reflected in the research as well in maybe the next update of Gareth and colleagues' uh, Cochrane review. Um, I will pause here briefly for some reflections before I just make a short, uh, short overview of the project I'm working on. Are there any reflections that came up or questions that came up here in the audience? <clears throat> a lot in the chat? There is quite a bunch in the chat, which oh, is yeah. wonderful. <laughs> Um, there's one question from mm -hmm. Charles Washburn asking if you could describe the nature of the music therapy intervention being discussed in that okay. review. In that review. Oh, they were very different. They, a lot of them were focused on improvisational music therapy. It, it was quite diverse, actually. Um, but I would have to check a little bit better. Um, yeah, we can come back to that later in the Q&A. Um, section. I'll, I'll check that. But great question. Thank you. Yes. I would just actually add to that because I do find that as a very commonly not discussed thing in research in what music is. You use music, you have music-based interventions, but what did they actually use and report? So I'm not surprised that it's probably like something that you have to look 
up <laughs> specifically to see what each study was reporting on. Um, I think that would be very useful for applications and um, for anyone and people in other fields to just understand what was happening during those sessions, during the research. I just wanted to add that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's my observation as well. Absolutely. And I think it's, yeah, it's, um, I feel like it's generally under reported what exactly it is that was happening it's very difficult to get a good view i think that that's another great point of where researchers should really step up a little bit because it's often just said music therapy or improvisational music therapy or this or that but it's very very important not only what you're doing and what is happening during music therapy uh, therapy but also who is doing the music therapy and these are these are things that are generally underreported in, in studies. I agree. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, I'll just briefly um, briefly go through through the research that I am working on at the moment. Uh, there has been some very interesting, I, I think it's very important to really go back to the subjective perspective at this point, because there is still so much that we don't know that we kind of have to ask ourselves the super basic questions about what it is that music means to an autistic person or to autistic people. Um, and there has been a, a great study done by Alan in 2009, and that was the very first study that actually asked that. So what is, what is music to you? How do you use it in your everyday life? Uh, and it's, it's kind of sad to know that the music was mentioned in regard to autism first in 1943. And then it took us 60, 70 years almost to kind of ask them, but what is music to you? So that's, but luckily these things are opening up a lot now. And there is this wonderful book by uh, Bakan, Bakan uh, who uh, discusses the more the existential value of music for autistic people and their, their experience of it. Um, if someone is interested in that field, I think it's a really great book. Uh, and then there was a recent study done by Kirby and Berland on uh, autistic uh, adolescents. And they asked them, they, they reported that they use music to accompany other activities, manage and express their emotions, develop social relationships, identity. So in, in large parts, it's very similar to how non-autistic individuals use music. Uh, and this is the first study that I did for my PhD project. I wanted to really start from the basics because we, we don't have any uh, data on that from Sweden. Uh, so we did interviews with 13 autistic adults. They were interviewed twice. It was roughly one hour of talk with each participant. Uh, I do have to mention that all of them were verbal. It was a very specific subgroup of autistic people. Um, and it would be very interesting to, to adapt the method in which we were collecting data so that we can get a more heterogeneous uh, population in the future. It was a hermeneutic phenomenological approach that we had to interpreting these uh, interviews. And we found four overarching themes. One was well-being, uh, which had largely to do with emotion regulation, with finding respite in music, with being able to uh, disconnect maybe some disturbing sounds from the environment and so forth. They were, a lot of these things were, were very um, easily recognizable from the non studies on non-autistic people actually. There was a part, they, there was a lot of talk on identity and self-development, uh, how they use music to express themselves, how they, get a sense of achievement from, from music, how they are able to grow through music. Um, there was a very important theme uh, that had to do with connecting, both to their heritage and their past, to other people. For example, some of them found it a lot easier to connect to other people in a nonverbal way. So they, had to, they didn't have to use words to feel like they're connecting to others but also uh, connecting to others through music, like uh, they, they experienced similar things that they wrote about, sang about, and it felt uh, like it was a uh, solace in that, they found solace in that. And then lastly, I'll just have a quick sip. <laughs> uh, 
And lastly, they also mentioned um, some negative experiences connected to music, which I think it's very interesting and important to, to discuss. They talked a lot about how uh, in different contexts, it can be quite disruptive and disturbing. For example, many of them really disliked music in stores and it made them, it, it was very difficult for them to focus on, on shopping. And a lot of them just left stores if there was uh, large music or very intense music. Uh, they talked about how it can sometimes be unpredictable and it can evoke negative emotions, although they approach it to maybe um, be a little happier, relax, suddenly it, it, it wakes negative emotions in them. Um, yeah, roughly about, about the negative experiences. But then this part was something that we thought, we kind of know that. We, this sounds very similar to the studies that were done on non-autistic people. But there were a few details that I think were very interesting. Uh, for example, some of them used music to connect with their sound environment. One of the participants, he was, uh, he did um, soundscape recordings, for example, of uh, metro trains, of uh, escalator stairs, and then he put these, all of, all of these little fragments together, and he created what he called an emotional diary. So it was his way of making music. He also added some digital music, and uh, it, it seemed like it was a way for him to deal with the demands or the, the, the difficulties of the sound environment that he was exposed to. Then they talked a lot about predictability and familiarity and how music helped them to stay calm, even in a little bit unpredictable situations, like going to a metro, being exposed to a lot of other people. It felt calming to have something very familiar in their ears. But on the other hand, they could use music to explore novelty, something that they weren't used to, but in a safe way. So they would often look for new, um, not only new artists or new pieces of music, but whole new genres. Um, and it felt like it, was, uh, it wasn't too much for them. They felt safe in that novelty. So I think it's, a, it's an interesting balance there. They used music to inform their routine. So it was easier for them to know how much time has passed because they knew, ah, I can have this playlist with these three songs. And after they're done, I have to start with this chore, for example. Or then it's that time and I have to move on with, with my day. Um, and some of them mentioned that it was a lot easier for them to connect without verbal communication to other people, especially um, there was one participant who talked a lot about dancing and how it was one of the rare ways for her to be able to relate to many people at the same time. Otherwise, she would get overwhelmed. And I think it's important to ask ourselves, even if these functions seem to be the same um, or at least very similar, it could be that they have a different impact on a day-to-day -day life. So we, probably all of us here, used music to block out other sounds at some point in our lives, um, but it can be so much more overwhelming if you have this way of experiencing the world that it's a lot more intense, a lot more unpredictable. So for someone who's autistic, um, having access to music and blocking out sounds, it could be a matter of maybe not even going to work because you get overwhelmed even on your way to work on a metro or on a busy bus. So although the functions might be the same and, and maybe even sound the, the findings sound a little boring at first, it could be that they're very, very important and have a large impact on their day-to-day -day life, which is what what many of them said that if I don't have access to music, my whole day collapses. I always have extra batteries, extra um, uh, headphones, so that I can really make sure that I have access to music. And then lastly, um, it seems like these uses of music can be two sides of the same coin. And in, for example, in one case, it could be that you make your own music and you feel a sense of uh, accomplishment. You can be proud of yourself. You can um, develop your skills. 
but they also mentioned that in many cases they become hyper focused on it and they start disregarding their other needs and their other routines and a whole night passes and they're still making digital music or recording something uh, so that can be a, a, a problem they mentioned that I think I mentioned that before but emotionally music can be a little bit unpredictable and wake some some negative emotions um there was oh i can't remember there were there were quite quite a few interest they gave quite a few interesting examples yo oh that's that's the one that i wanted to mention it was very interesting to hear that even if music was an amazing experience really nice they went into it they were in a different world it was kind of depressing and depleting when they came out of that world and when they stopped listening to music they came back to reality and they sort of got just sad or or depressed or didn't have that much energy anymore so it's always kind of two sides of the same coin very much dependent on the on the context um oh it got a little bit Oh, it's okay. So for the upcoming studies, uh, I will also reanalyze these interviews in regards to self-determination theory, because I think it would be also interesting to see, it feels like there are many of these themes clearly, clearly uh, reflected in the data that we have. And it also makes it easier to, to compare this, this, these results to other studies. Um, and then lastly, uh, or for my third study, we're going to be doing a survey-based uh, study, uh, and we'll be exploring how music engagement is connected to better mental well-being, because this is one of the uh, wishes of the community as well, to have more research and more knowledge about well-being and quality of life. And for that, we'll be using the Perkins and colleagues model of uh, mental well-being. Sorry, it got a little bit out of sync, but I hope you can see it. So we'll be measuring uh, how they manage emotions in their day-to-day -day life, self-development, respite connections, and try to see how it connects to their mental well-being. So if I just make a quick summary, um, I wanted to discuss with you about, yeah, expected outcomes are they also desired outcomes and really stopping and asking ourselves what it is that we are measuring and about the importance of first-person perspectives, which luckily we have more and more of those. I think it's a great contribution to, to this field and it's really developing here. Uh, and the value of community-informed research and also really the importance of checking the adverse events because at the moment we don't have that much information on that, but it's really, a, I think, a great opportunity for future research and very important one. Yeah, that's that's it from me. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Kaya, for an incredibly engaging and informative lecture there um, or talk. There's a lot for us to consider there. And uh, in the interest of time, we'd like to suggest that we hold Q&A for both you and Ava together after Ava's presentation, if that sounds all right. Thank you. So I am very glad to introduce our third and final speaker today. Um, Ava Voiner Horwitz is a professor of music and health at the Royal College of Music in Stockholm and a researcher in the Department of Neurobiology, Care Sciences and Society at the Carolina Institute. Um, Ava specializes in psychosomatic medicine and the creative arts and is a co-founder of the Center for Social Sustainability. Her work is anchored in interdisciplinary research, combining different quantitative methods with qualitative methods. So we're very excited to learn more about her work and uh, allow me to welcome her up now. Thank you. So thank you very much for inviting us and uh, yeah, we are three generation music and health researchers here. And uh, it's, it's really fantastic. We met with you, Lisa, in uh, Wong in Berlin, and, uh, and also with Suzanne, of course, 
in 2016. So uh, I hope this uh, rhythm will continue and uh, it's amazing to be here. Thank you so much. So uh, I was thinking about sharing four things inspi inspired by you, Torres. Torres, you were, uh, you are, are my former supervisor. So uh, it has been for almost 30 years we have been working together. So what do I pick? Uh, I, I will go uh, into the same direction and, and try to talk a little bit about unexpected findings from our research. I will start with the IDGs because you uh, heard about the Center for Social Sustainability, which we created 10 years ago at Karolinska Institute. So we are doing a lot of um, thinking about how can we use music to relate to the Agenda 2030 work and the inner developmental goal work. So I would start by, the, by uh, commenting on that. Can you say what the IDG stands for? The inner developmental goals, yeah. So uh, I would start by that. And then I would go into the transformative skills because I think uh, for our next generations, we can do so much more in an easy way with simple evaluation methods to work with uh, transformative skills. And I will come back to and, and define that as well. And then I will go into some studies and uh, some method developments that we have been working with uh, me and Torres together. And also uh, last but not least, talk about how music can be a strong contributor to a more social sustainable world. So the inner develop developmental goals uh, it is a concept now, I think, globally. We have been working with the Agenda 2030 for many years now, but it's very hard for us to work with the, uh, the 17 sustain sustainable uh, goals without asking questions. And now I relate to you, Kaya, to uh, first-person perspectives of health. How can we sustain our own health before we start to work with uh, groups, uh, societies, global works. So the five uh, themes that we together, there is a consensus now in the world about the inner developmental goals. It's about being, thinking, relating, collaborating and acting. So those five skills can easily be re related to different kinds of music activities. I will come back to that. So what music does is closely related to factors involved in social sustainability. And maybe this is self-evident for you in this room, for us in this room here, but in our societies, in our school systems, in our healthcare systems, this is quite new. So we must, I think, start to very concrete talk about what's inside in music. It's also related to social sustainability skills, such as empathy, emotions and memories, of course, movements and motor planning, sound, executive function, language learning, reading, higher order thinking, visual speciality, all those very concrete, important skills to be able to handle. Uh, the future of our world. And here can music target every single part. And we have a lot of research behind this. So thereby I will introduce the word of process learning. So when we come from the Agenda 2030 work and with the, which is mandatory for us to talk about with our students in Sweden. And then we need the IDGs, the Inner Developmental Goals, to be able to work with those process learning skills. So process learning is a prerequisite to implement so societal change. And I will give you five skills. And uh, these are skills that was introduced to uh, Center for Social Sustainability, first time by a colleague of, of ours, uh, Maria Niemi. And I find those five skills very useful when it comes to our uh, music uh, and health uh, research. So the, the first skill is to being able to create images. And when we, we, we may be, well, in, in Sweden nowadays, we down-regulate the amount of music lessons in school systems. And uh, we haven't maybe 
thought about the importance of creating those inner images to be able to, what we, when we perceive music, we also can transform this into mental images that can give us a new understanding of things. Uh, so uh, to be able to create those visions, to be able to image, uh, to imagine the future uh, with the basic idea that we need to know what we want to aim for in order to be able to take the steps to develop that in that direction. So music listening and music playing both passively and actively create those images. The second skill, and now I'm, I'm talking about the five skills uh, of process learning. So the second skill is about the critical and ethical thinking. And this, these are skills that may be self-evident for us, but when we work with uh, in preschools, schools, uh, how is, is it okay to use uh, music listening activities to start to reflect on ethical things, how we behave, how we treat each other when we play, uh, et cetera? Yes, it is. So reflecting on music is part of a critical thinking process. And I will give you some examples later on. The third skill is about system thinking. The skill to understand and look for links and synergies in different parts of the society. Yeah, you can read here. Music is part of this system thinking. And uh, we let also kids draw, self-figure drawings, and to try to see how they perceive music. And when we look at those self-figure drawings after intervention when they have been in uh, the first time and we listen to uh, 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 classical piano play, for example, we can see that they, when, when they have listened to music, they integrate part of that instrument, of the piano, the grand piano in this sense, into the self-figure drawing. And they start to think with their bodies. They embody a system. And we give you an example of this soon. So, the fourth skill is about the ability to create partnership dialogue negotiations. And uh, a prerequisite here is uh, an interprofessional and cross-professional education that dismantles professional, professional silos and promote collaborative and non-hierarchical group compositions, such as musicianship. So this is the fourth skill. And the last skill is a bit about empowerment and working with uh, Kaya's project and trying to understand the two sides of this cone, coin, I mean, <laughs> my jet lag is kicking in here. <laughs> it's it's uh, what do we think? Our hypothesis about empowering the music. We maybe look at the other side of that coin. And this is why I think Kaya's work is so super important. So, we also need to help our societies to use those simple evaluation methods that we do have. It doesn't need to be an MRR or a, a blood analysis to go through the cortisol or a, the heart rate variability. Especially when we are working in school systems, we can use very simple evaluation methods. So we have been, and I've picked now a couple of studies related to this to maybe inspire the audience here uh, all through our globe to start to do also piloting with your uh, at your workplace with with preschoolers and and dementia patients to use uh, very simple methods such as the visual analog scale and we have been working with that with different audiences I will soon give you an example of that self figure drawings as I mentioned which means that you give an instruction such as draw how you perceive your body right now, or what is going on in your body right now. Draw a drawing for two minutes. So we are doing these kinds of drawings now with seven and eight years old in, in, in Swedish school systems uh, after they have been singing and control for that. And also, of course, the video interpretation technique that will, it's about video recording, movement patterns, and that the, participant or the uh, patient him herself interpret the movement patterns that is uh, involved in this uh, video recording. So if we start with three different studies that we have been uh, what we have been working with and still are uh, the role of music and health in early life, we have the sing health in preschools, we have sing health in primary schools, 
and we are also working with knowledge concerts. So the first uh, project here, the Seeing Health in Preschools, that I mentioned earlier, the preschool classes, they arrive into Royal College of Music and they meet live classical piano music. And here we have our professor, Stefan Shea in piano, in front of his grand piano. So the question is, how do the children relate to each other? Uh, their emotional reactions. Uh, so uh, how could we figure out about this? We are video recording the sessions and we are also using self-figure drawing. So they draw pre and post this uh, appassionata. So uh, by Beethoven, uh, Professor Shea is playing this. And there are also very fun discussion in between the audience and Professor Shea. So it's kind of questions, are you sure you can play that grand piano? You know, and Stefan asks answers that, oh, yes, I think so. I can also play. Can I please try to play? And you know all those behaviors that are uh, engaging the the preschoolers here. And we are recording this with video, and we are then also analyzing the different video um, films. So this is a very easy way to use this. On the right hand side, you see different kinds of self figure drawings from the same. This is from the same patient, actually. This is not uh, the drawings from, from the, the kids, but this is how you can also use a self-figure drawing for an artistic uh, uh, or a dementia or a preschooler or a, a person with uh, exhaustion disorders. We have used this in many different, with many different target groups. For example, this is a patient with fibromyalgia uh, and she did a drawing every third week. So for 18 months, you can see her uh, trip from the first number one here in the corner of this paper and the 23rd, I think it is here, when she is in the sailing boat. And she, it, this uh, was much more important for this patient than the blood analysis. And she was also, this was a receipt for her, for her whole experience with music and dance experience that we put together. So that was about um, the self-figure drawing part. Next uh, study that we are working with right now is the Sing Health in School. So how does daily singing in primary school affect emotional, cognitive, language, and social functioning and abilities? So singing strengthens the de developmental linguist ability. We already know that. And, uh, but how does this work in our school systems in Sweden? And uh, what about the unexpected results? We have been interviewing now the schools, the teachers, and, and the, how can we organize in mean, a quarter of an hour every day for three months? It's quite hard. But we have succeeded to do this, and we are now comparing with the control schools to see how we can uh, start to implement this. We have received huge funding uh, in Sweden right now to continue to also train music teachers in, in uh, our school system. So this is very, very good. And what we do, we video record the group of uh, participants and they create things together so we can understand how they change their behavior. There are, for example, a task is try to uh, do a circle together. And you know, there are 24, 28 pupils there in the room and they uh, organize those things and we video record it and we analyze how they, uh, how they also affect their behaviors after this seeing health in school. And we also use uh, different kinds of visual analog scales that I showed you earlier. And the last thing here for the is this knowledge concert concept that we have uh, been uh, working with. Knowledge concert, it means it's a live concert uh, experience in which the audience is gaining knowledge. We're inviting researchers and we are uh, our music students, they are, uh, so it's, this is a sort of, sort of a win-win situation and we are evaluating this as well. And then we have audiences for two, I think 250 participants in an audience. So we use self we, we use the visual uh, analog scale and let them evaluate uh, arousal, uh, energy, et cetera. And, and, and we can, we can uh, after this knowledge concert also, uh, 
get information. So we will continue with this uh, in different uh, setups, with different teams on different themes. So we're going on into the higher education and midlife. I'm, I started to talk a little bit faster here, but I think I will manage to receive my endpoint slide soon. So uh, we also have other uh, activities going on. We have uh, had uh, Erasmus Plus money, and I also heard yesterday in Washington that we also can do a collaboration with America and Europe with Erasmus Plus. I didn't actually know that, so this is very inspiring for us to know. So we have been working with Erasmus Plus to uh, very concrete work with video films for students to increase their health. So we call the platform Hearts, Health, Arts and Sustainability, and all those video recordings and video films, you can use them, they are three, three and a half minutes long. And uh, this is to buffer against ill health for student teachers and also for researchers. And with colleagues, we also have, uh, yeah, so uh, this is, I think I can send it also together with our presentations to, to you, Suzanne, so you can also use those video films. And we have also evaluated uh, different educational program in Sweden. We had just, we just published this. This is one year of transformation course. And we can see how the transformation and how, you, how do you transform into a more uh, sustainable uh, entrepreneurship, for example. How can we do this in our educational programs? How can we use uh, embodied transformation? How can we use music? How can we uh, train and, and, and into more a benevolent way of living through those courses? So we have just started with the evaluations of this. This was just published. And here we have another sort of knowledge concert. It is about, uh, it's every ninth, uh, every year, 9th of December, a prelude before Nobel. So our first prelude before Nobel, uh, uh, it, it was uh, Thurs, you, you were responsible for that. And, and you uh, shared uh, a fantastic narrative about your father, Mr. Uh, Hugo Thurel, who received the Nobel Prize in 1954 in, in, in uh, medicine. So we combine again and try to work transdisciplinary with uh, science and uh, music and our music uh, students. Uh, and, and we uh, do a, yeah, a, a true fantastic prelude before Nobel. And we will try to also send this via Zoom this, coming, this year. And the last, uh, how do we, uh, how, what kind of work do we do in end of life? Yes. During the pandemic, we had so many questions from intensive care units. And uh, how can we uh, use music for patients when their relatives are not allowed to be in the room? So uh, we try to help by uh, giving examples how it's important to ask what kind of music is a person really interesting to, to be in? And how could we organize this via an app, an iPhone? And uh, there are also um, research now uh, on, on this uh, grieving process and how we can work with music in funerals. So I would start by sharing one of the important findings from this pro project when we asked relatives about what what kind of meaning is it with the music that is played during a, a funeral for, for, the, for the, the absent person? And then they uh, say that for, for me, it was the most important part was to, uh, in the remembrance of, of a close dear, to, to really use the music uh, if it's played live. So live music is more important than recorded music. And also, it helps to uh, uh, the morning process, uh, morning process afterwards. So this was findings from interview studies that we did together with a music therapist, Marianne Viper. If you are uh, online now, so, so that was. And also during the pandemic, we uh, asked a question. It was a project uh, where we asked, "What do you miss the most 
uh, when you are not allowed to sing in a choir during the COVID. And it was quite surprising that, uh, for me at least, that this uh, the aesthetic component, the importance of aesthetics and physical activity, uh, that was the thing you, you missed the most when you, when you have more number of years in a choir. So the social component, of course, uh, but also the aesthetical experience and the flow uh, to be into this flow and the physical aspects of singing. So this was an, um, yes, this was uh, also quite easy because we handled out questionnaires in Norway and Sweden and we collected data by those questionnaires. So this is also very easily uh, part of what we recommend now in the school system, healthcare systems to use these kinds of questionnaires to really have an idea about this specific group of people here. How can we use, for example, seeing health or uh, let, let uh, our music st uh, students visit workplaces, not only music in residence, but, but also uh, companies. Last but not least, uh, we have been working with St. Petersburg with a project uh, in hospice. And uh, when a person knows that you have very few days left in life, how do you work with this with music and fair taste? So, so we figured out that the music can stretch their perception of time. So here is the Kairos time focus instead of the Kronos time. So this fairy tale method that we have been uh, presented in this study, uh, it was very uh, meaningful for music musicians to work together with fairy tale for narrators. It's fairy tale, uh, 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 yeah, narrators. To, to combine their expertise in a transdisciplinary way to uh, calibrate, as I wrote here, awareness, different kinds. So when it, we go back again, and uh, it's not only because it's mandatory for me to talk about the IDGs the, uh, in a developmental goals, but I think my uh, wish or intention with my uh, Smurgos board here today is to, to really uh, try to put the Agenda 2030 in a concrete way with music activities in all our working places, school system, healthcare systems. So we understand that we have a lot of work to do and it's also quite fun to evaluate this in, in pilot groups, recommend students to use those uh, simple ev evaluation methods and uh, to also not forget about what Kaya mentioned, the first person perspective, to ask questions about how. How do you know that this is something that is important for you? And uh, continue also to be more open with transdisciplinary work. So I think I stop here and uh, maybe we could have time for a couple of questions or maybe we do that together with Kaya so we can uh, yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much for a really elegant talk. You all have given us so much to consider. Um, what I'd like to suggest is to open up questions in particular to anyone joining us remotely via Zoom or in the chat. So feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like or um, can offer a question in the chat. We'll read it out for either Kaya or Ava. So feel free to come on up. And um, of course, we welcome questions in the room as well. We start in the room. Mm -hmm. sure. we address uh, Charles Washburn's comment. Sure, I can I can share that out. Um, yes, Charles Washburn provided a really um, insightful comment related to your work, Kaya. Mm -hmm. uh, he states, Thank it you. would be interesting to connect your research on the impact of music on the ability of an individual with autism, particularly those who are focused on sensory seeking to meet their sensory needs. 
that is music and movement as a tool for meeting a sensory diet. Very interesting. He has any uh, articles to suggest maybe? I'd love to read more about that, but super interesting uh, idea. Absolutely, right? Thank you, Charles, thank you. Thank you uh, for your, your talks. And this is a question for Ava. Uh, you presented so much wonderful work from childhood through the college years through to the end of life. Is this all work that's being done at um, the Royal College of Music right now that get, get your meeting? So really across the whole spectrum of life? Yes, it is. Yeah. And I would also like to mention my colleague, of course, David Turi. And I think you are, you are with us even though it's 12 o'clock in, in Sweden. <laughs> but uh, yes, together with uh, colleagues from Royal College of Music, yeah. Mm -hmm. And just to clarify for those online, the question was that all of this work is being conducted at the Carolina Institute. Just to make sure they heard that. Yes, uh, Royal College of Music. And we are affiliated uh, to Karolinska Institute. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, more questions. Uh, question for Kaya. Uh, thank you for your talk. I appreciate you asking uh, the population you were working with, what does music mean to you? I thought the answers were fascinating. Um, and I don't think it's more transparent to any musician always what music means to them. But I thought it was fascinating that the answers that you've gotten from primary themes didn't seem to vary widely, well, at least not obviously from the general population. So I was wondering, how you saw these answers varying meaningfully, and if, if so, how would you go about measuring the distinction? So you, I think you also caught that there are similar answers, but maybe you postulating that the, the, um, the valence of the experience was greater. How would you go about measuring that? So the question was, um, sorry, I have to <laughs> gather my, it, my internal clock is midnight right now, and that's roughly how awake I am. <laughs> But it was a super important question. It was regarding uh, the importance of the difference or the size of the differences between general population and autistic population in how they experience music and use music in their day-to-day -day lives. And I think that's a very important uh, question, which we cannot answer uh, with my study that was conducted with only 13 adults. It was just initial exploratory study that would indicate possible differences. And I think to answer your question, you would have to do uh, a large, I, I would go with a survey based uh, study, and we would need a lot more data for that. But I think it's very important to look into that um, in the future. Absolutely. I hope that answered your question. You mentioned that before. I, wasn't I will take a look and check if there are any we didn't address. Um, well, let me, let me double check as I look through the chat. Yeah, if there's any other. Um... Who's on? Oh, I was just going to ask in our final minute because we need to say goodbye to our online yeah. participants. Yeah, so that, yeah. If you had just. One comment about the most important work that you have done. What comes to mind first and choice about either your your answer as well? Your yeah, most important work. There is. All of this. Yeah. So yeah, the question is if you would like to summarize Torres. Not summarize. What, no. What, no, one word. word. Yeah, with one word with one word, your most important your most important important contribution with your research one with one word <laughs> besides your two wonderful students <laughs> uh, yes i think um, the most important experience with this research has been um, that we can dive into uh, this complex into play between music and people and uh, uh, describe uh, how meaningful it is in 
biological, social, and psychological terms. And that uh, we are surprised at the uh, magnitude of uh, this uh, relationship and, and the importance of it for all society. And it pops up in unexpected uh, circumstances uh, all the time. So uh, that's the main uh, all over thing for me. If I understood the question correctly, what, what was the most meaningful work that, that I've done? I, I'm a baby researcher. I'm just starting off. So I feel like there, there's not that much to say, but I feel like in, in my work, the most meaningful uh, work was actually done by, by the participants that I was privileged to, to meet and the how very open they were towards us and how very readily they gave us insight into their lives and also their time that there were pretty long interviews so i i think i i that was the the greatest uh, contribution i think to to the field that we've received and i'm very grateful for for their um openness and, and honesty really yeah so now i had time to think a bit so <laughs> uh but for me it's um the power of well, the power with this with using by using simple evaluation methods to really also ask three, four years old uh, to draw how they feel and how much of information it is in that self figure drawing. And when the grand piano moved into a self figure drawing from a three and a half year old. I think that was a major finding for me. And I, I think the simplicity, and I try to give you a small, an idea of, we should not forget to, to also spread this, uh, these methodologies uh, to teachers. It doesn't mean to be, you don't need to be a researcher to use this. You can also pilot in your school, in your class, in healthcare. So yes, that is my contribution. So thank you to our wonderful guests from Stockholm um, and for just really, really inspiring us today with just the very different ways of thinking about how important music um, is in all of our lives, but also the really interesting research that is being done. Um, this, the I Am, it really is bringing us all together thanks to um, your work, Suzanne, and all of the people at I Am for really bringing an international perspective to all of this. Um, there's lots of more questions and more ideas that are happening. Um, our guests who are here are going to be uh, welcome to a little bit of supper after this. But um, uh, Suzanne, if you wanna say just a few words uh, to our Zoom participants. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you everybody. And thank you, Ava and Torres and, and Kaya. And I want to thank our host, Dr. Lisa Wong, for arranging all of this for us today and always her interest in uh, music, medicine, health, arts, all of the things we value so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wong. I'm afraid we haven't answered all of your questions, but please feel free to contact any of our uh, any of our speakers, they're nodding their heads. Yes, please communicate with them. And uh, please join I am be an active member of this incredible global community. We really appreciate your presence today, tonight, this morning, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for being with us. And we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.